This morning's Torah portion is called Ve'etze. Everybody say Ve'etze. The Vav, or the V sound, is and, and Yetze means to go out. So this is the message of Yaakov going out from his parents' house, and he's going towards something. He's going from the people who birthed him, and he's going to find the wife of which the children of Israel will come through. And so we're going to talk about Yaakov's journey, leaving his parents, going towards his wife, and in between, what happens? He studies with Shem, and he learns the ways of the Torah, and to carry on the priesthood. And he is prepared in mind to receive this vision that Hashem gives him of all of his future seed but in the form of this ladder this this ladder which has much symbolism which we're going to take a t little bit of time out from the Torah portion and really focus on the symbolism of this ladder and how it applies to us today before we begin we will go over some of the chapters as an outline so you know what we're looking at today the first part is the end of chapter 28 where we left off last week and we go right into Yaakov's dream and of the ladder going to heaven and the angels ascending and descending upon it and in chapter 29 we read the story of Yaakov meeting Raquel and then how he gets tricked he gets deceived very similar to the way he deceives his father and we'll look at some of the symbolism there there's so many parallels to whatever you do in life it comes back we have to learn the lesson and we'll keep it'll keep coming back into our life until we learn that lesson so the years that he spent away learning these lessons he later gets robbed of those years from Joseph because of his deception with his father he loses 22 years and it's the same 22 years that he loses from his son so we're gonna see a lot of different parallels and the way he deceives his father being the youngest and taking the blessing of the eldest he gets tricked by being given the eldest when he really has the heart for the youngest so there's a lot of unique parallels in this story of his wife and uh, the four mothers of the children of Israel in uh, the end of chapter 29 and uh, through most of chapter 30 we read about the birth of the 12 tribes of Israel and then we go into how Yaakov is prospered by the Lord by using wisdom based on eternal principles and we'll find out what those eternal principles are and how to apply them to our life and then we see the the story of Yaakov fleeing from Laban with family and flocks and how Laban overtakes him and then how Yaakov and Laban make a covenant so we've got only four chapters but a lot of depth and a lot of principles and a lot of things that we can apply to our life today so as we go into the parties a little understanding as to where we're going to go with our focus most of the message today is going to be focused on Jacob's ladder we see that Yaakov goes out from his parents and he's going from his parents seed he's the seed of his parents and he's going to the place where he's going to find a wife and the progeny of his own seed and in between God gives him a vision of what the true seed looks like and what the real issue is with God's seed God's seed is his word right we know that in the parable of the sower and the seed the word of God is likened to seed planted in a field and so man was created in the image of God and we're going to see that this ladder from heaven has to do with this image and that it has the same gematria 130 uh, as image and that God's word is literally the DNA ladder that Yaakov is seen and we know that the angels the watchers have ascended and descended upon it some holy but some have fallen and tried to mix their seed with God's seed to have a creation in their image to receive worship for themselves so this is a very deep principle and then we're going to go into the knowledge of the counterfeit image in our day what is happening currently and what is going to be happening uh, continuing on a larger scale in the very near future 
We have some enlarged anomalies uh, that we'll look at. And uh, we'll also see the symbolism of the stone that Yaakov lays his head on. The stone in Hebrew is Eben, and it's Aleph, Beit, and Nun. And the symbolism of the Aleph, Beit, this is the word Av in Hebrew, the word for father. But this last part of the word, Beit Nun, is Bin, which is the word for son. So in this stone, you literally see an image of the father and the son. And this stone, he sets up after having this dream as a pillar. And the word pillar actually has the same gematria as ladder in Hebrew and image. And this pillar becomes the cornerstone of the temple, which we know Yeshua, who's the word of God, is the cornerstone which the builders rejected. So there's so much amazing hidden symbolism that we're going to get into. And then uh, in Jubilees, we're going to find out that in chapter 27, this actually occurred on the first day of the first month of the year. So this is the Aviv barley. This is the uh, two weeks before Passover. And we see some other significant things like yod heh vav -He is on the ladder. This isn't something that we see in the Torah, but comes out in the book of Jubilees. And we also see in verse 22 that Yaakov's future seed is inside of him. So this is all about seed and how God wants to plant his seed, his word in us, to make us in his image and to recreate us since sin back into his image. But how the enemy and the fallen angels have tried to sow their seed and deface the image of God in man and receive worship because they now have a creation after their own image. So there's a lot in this Torah portion. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 28 and we'll start off in verse 10. And it says, Yahov went out from Beersheba. This is Vayetze Yahov me Beersheba. And he traveled toward Haran. So why does it say that he departed from one place and he's traveling to another place? Normally it would just say, and Jacob went to Haran, right? But there's a significance separating the two. He's leaving one thing and he's going towards another. And in between, what's amazing is there's 14 years when Yaakov was... Um, Probably from the age of seven to the age of 63, he studied Torah from his father, Yitzhak. Now it's said that Avraham had many students. Uh, he had a yeshiva where he taught Torah. And he would teach anyone who was willing to receive it. Plus he had 300 other men and their families uh, living with him as his own family. And so he had many pupils. But it is said of Yitzhak that he focused all his energy on studying to or teaching Torah to his son Yaakov. He only had one pupil. Esau was out hunting and doing other things, but Yaakov, for 63 years in essence, was learning from his father. Imagine that kind of dedication. Then he leaves his father's house and he goes and he studies Torah from Shem, Melchizedek, king of righteousness from Salem, which is the future Jerusalem. And so he's learning more about the principles of seed. And so it says he departs from Beersheba. This is where his parents live. So he's departing from his parents and he's learning the father's seed and he's going to Haran where he'll meet his wife and have his own seed. So there's a whole uh, deep meaning right here in this first verse. Verse 11 says, he came to a certain place. Uh, Mahom is the word in Hebrew. And whenever it says Mahom, it's kind of like nudging you. It's like you know the place, that certain place. What is that certain place? Where's the place where God has placed his name? Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, more specifically, where is the temple built? But up on Mount Moriah. So he's actually going, this certain place is a clue telling you that he's actually up on the Temple Mount. He's up on Mount Moriah. And he stayed there the whole night because the sun had set. And he took an ebon, a stone. It is said of this stone that this is the very place where God took the the beginning of creation, the very first um, matter, and that it's also the place where God took the dust to form Adam. 
And so this stone, it has a foundation in creation and it has an amazing history. And for some reason, Yaakov takes this stone and it's interesting that it says the stone because when in the ancient times you would be in an unknown place and you would want protection and we do this when we climb mountains as well we will put a windbreaker or a buffer around our head you can see what's coming but you don't know what's coming from your head there might be a wild animal there might be a marauder so you actually build a little wall and it buffers you from wind and it also buffers you from anybody coming up on you so he placed 12 stones around his head but it is said that these 12 stones one can't be better than the other so these 12 stones merge together into the one stone he takes this stone from this place and he puts it under his head and he lays down to sleep and there he dreamt before him was a ladder this ladder in hebrew is sulam and we read in John, uh, both the first chapter and chapter 14, that Mashiach is the true ladder, which is to say that the very word of God is the true ladder. You can see here in this map the areas where the patriarchs have traveled. Abraham came from Ur, and he is the red line. He went up to Haran, basically dropped off his father and his brother, Nahor and then came down um, to, uh, to Damascus area and then into Israel. And then when he came and fought the kings, he came back up. So all of this, and then he went down into Egypt during the famine. So the red you can think of as Abraham's journeys. The purple, as you can see, just this little back and forth, this is Yitzhak. Yitzhak's the only patriarch who never left the land of Israel. You can see he went from Beersheba up to Hebron, up to Mount Moriah and back down and that was pretty much the extent of his life was right here in the heart of Israel now Yaakov he's born down here in Beersheba but he travels up here to Haran in this week's Torah portion to get a wife from Nahor's family this is the same place where Rivka came from Laban is Rivka's brother and Rachel is uh, Rivka's niece and so he's coming up in this tour portion and it's here he's left Beersheba it's here in um, Mount Moriah that he has this dream to put it into context and he dreamed and behold a ladder was set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold it says angels of God were ascending and descending upon it yes Lydia Yes, so 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, but merged together in the cornerstone, which will become the future cornerstone of the temple. And it's also said, this is the stone that's referred to uh, about Mashiach, that he is the cornerstone that the builders rejected, who came through the uh, Yaakov's lineage. So, <clears throat> here we have a picture of a ladder. But if you understand how much this passage is focusing on the seed, he's going from his parents, he's going to his future wife, and God gives him a revelation of his word as a DNA ladder. Ladder Sulam has a gematria of 130. We're going to look at other words that have a correlation to 130 because in Hebraic uh, thinking, one word that has a value, uh, a certain value, and another word that has a certain, that same value, even though it's seemingly unrelated, there is a deeper correlation between the two. This is God's way of telling us that we're supposed to learn something deeper by bringing these words together. So if you twist this ladder, you can literally see a DNA chain and the correlation between the DNA. And Yaakov's ladder, Zerah is the word for seed in Hebrew. The word for priest, remember the priestly lineage is going to come through Yaakov. That's why he's learning from Shem and learning from his father. The word for the priest is 130 as well. So the image of God has to remain 
pure in order for the priestly line to pass down through it. Once it's defaced, that person, like Esau taking Hittite wives and the wife of Ishmael, was unfit for the priesthood. This is why the priesthood had to pass through Yaakov. It says, He saw a ladder reaching with its top to heaven, and angels were going up and down on it. Then suddenly Adonai was standing there next to him. And in the book of Jubilees, it actually says that yod heh vav was standing on the ladder next to him. Yes? Um, the fitness is more than just DNA. Isn't it a spiritual condition as well because of Ruth and... Absolutely. Like, yes. Um, if you are from this lineage, this pure lineage, if the true DNA is defaced, then... You, you won't be fit for the priestly lineage. Now, there's people that came out from other cultures. This is why Abraham took Lot under his wing, because he actually saw that the future Mashiach would come from Lot, not even thinking about himself. Of course, Mashiach came through both Lot and from Abraham. And Ruth, of course, is the Moabite who was the descended from the, one of the sons of Lot's ancestral relationship with his daughter. And so we see this, this, that lineage was still uncontaminated as far as we're talking about the hybridization of what was happening before the flood. Angels were fusing their DNA or their seed with the seed of the daughters of men. And then they're no longer in the image of God the way he created them as a bride for himself. Self. So uh, in Torah, a husband always has to take not only a pure bride, a virgin bride, but somebody from his own species, of course, or from his own tribe even to bring it home even more. Now there's those of Canaanite tribes who had this hybrid mixture from the uh, watchers before the flood through Ham's wife, and they were not fit for the priestly lineage to go through them. So in verse 12, let's read up to verse 12. The Lord is standing there on the ladder, and he says, I am yod heh vav -Heh, Elohim of Abraham, your grandfather, the God of Yitzhak, and the land on which you are lying, I am going to give to you and to your descendants. This word descendants is zera, it's seed. So once again, it's bringing our mind back to this DNA transfer through the seed. And God's seed is his word. Your zera, your seed, will be as numerous as the grains of dust on the earth. You will expand to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. But you and your seed, your zera, and all the families of the earth will be blessed. Look, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will bring you back into this land, because I won't leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Yaakov awoke from his sleep, and he said, Truly, yod heh vav -Heh is in this place, and I didn't know it. This is like a portal. This is a certain area that is so significant where God has placed his name that he's getting this amazing download of information through this vision. And he says, this has to be the house of God. This is why everyone after this knew that this would be the place where the temple was to dwell throughout perpetuity in uh, the future. Throughout eternity, God's temple is going to be at this place. So he names it House of God or Temple of God. Beit El is the name of that place. Now, we know that our bodies are the temple of God. So in essence, the very place where he gets this vision of the DNA of God, the image of God in man, is likened even to us as temples. This is the house of God. And, yes, Bill? Well, in that same verse, this is the gate of heaven. It's kind of like a portal. That's right. And then when you go to John 10, 7, it says... And we're going to see Yeshua even refer to himself as the ladder in a little bit. When he Remember when he brings in Nathaniel uh, as a, one of the apostles and he says, I saw you under the fig tree. He says, you will see me in the future 
with angels ascending and descending upon me. He's referring to himself as the ladder because he is the word made flesh. This is the word that we should have. A year ago. That's right. We're going to go even deeper than we did one year ago. Why? You have good notes. <laughs> that's awesome, Carlos. And to have them today, that's beautiful. So this ladder is sulam in the Hebrew. And if you look at the Samic, which has a gematria of 60, and the Lamed, which has a value of 30, and the Mem Sofit, which has a gematria of 40, it totals 130. The same gematria as God's other portal. Now remember, the Temple Mount is one portal, right? This is uh, where he's having this vision. But did you know Sinai? has the same gematria, 130. This is where he brought his word down. So it's in essence, there's two places where he has transferred his DNA. One is where he took Adam, the dust from for Adam, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and transferred that DNA. That was the word. On Sinai, many years later, God brings down his word, and they have an exact same gematria, same correlation. You see the... Samic, which we know is 60. Yod is 10. Noon is uh, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem. Noon is 50. And Yod is 10. So you have basically have 70 plus 60, 130. Exodus 19.11 says, And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people. Interesting correlation with the third day, because since the first time Yeshua came, we refer to the Millennial Kingdom as the third day. And once again, we have the living Torah recreating us in the image of God through the transference of His Word teaching Torah. So it's beautiful. You see this three times there uh, in Adam and on Sinai and then in the third day, future being alluded to. And Mount Sinai was altogether in smoke because the Lord descended upon it. Interesting, this word descended, because remember how he's transferring himself, and even angels are ascending and descending on this ladder, and it's referring to it by the same word that he descended upon it, and the smoke ascended. So you have this word ascended and descended in reference to his word being transferred on Mount Sinai. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. Now there's another reference one of the fun things that I love to do in the Hebrew is look throughout the Torah and find other words that have the same gematria. Exodus 35, 11 is talking about the building of the temple, which we know our body is like the temple of God. And look at the different references to the different aspects of the temple like our own body. The tabernacle, his tent, it's referring to it as a his. And sometimes in the Hebrew, his and its are interchangeable. So, we have a tent, right? We have a covering, basically. Who's our covering? The Word, Yeshua. And who's the woman's covering? Her husband. So, we all have a tent. We all have a covering. And our skin, our clothing, since we've sinned, we went from beings of light to being clothed with garments of skin in, from Genesis. So, it refers to the tabernacle's covering. And its boards. And its bars and its pillars. This is like our bones and muscles and sinews. And the word pillar has a gematria of 130, which is interesting. Because Jacob's stone, remember he's having this dream of the ladder which is, has a gematria of 130. He takes the very stone which becomes the cornerstone of the temple and he sets it up as the ultimate pillar which represents Yeshua, Messiah. He is our pillar. He is our cornerstone. He is the rock of our salvation. Deuteronomy 31, 21 says, It shall not be forgotten out of the mouth of their seed. So here you have this DNA transference from the mouth. There's two ways that DNA is transferred. It's either from the mouth, the way that God created the first Adam, or it is from the word, which is likened unto the seed of the loins, which went into the womb of Mary and created the second Adam. So God has two sons. I mean, he has more than two sons, but these are all sons of God created in different ways through the transference of his DNA word. And so here, what's interesting is mem pe yod, which means uh, from the mouth, has a gematria 
of 130, showing that this DNA link to the ladder and to the Word of God and to the pillar, Messiah, has that same... This is mape. Yeah, out of the mouth. Yep. Just like if you cough on somebody, you transfer, you know, the, the DNA, or you could take a swab. Nowadays, pe people send in their DNA and they do a cotton swab. It's from the mouth. There's two places where we get this seed uh, DNA. Now it even gets deeper. This year, God has revealed something this week as I was meditating on this Torah portion, which I never saw in its full extent before. But in Deuteronomy... 4 6, it likens this ladder to an image. You know how God created us by speaking things into existence, but then He breathed into Adam His breath, His DNA was transferred, and Adam was created in His image. He said, Let us make man in our image, right? Well, this word image is amazing because it has the same numerical value. What is the odds? of ladder and Sinai and out of the mouth. It is uh, 130 and it's used in the context of that there's a true DNA and there's a false DNA. There's a true image and there's a false image. It says, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make a graven image. The similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. When this hit me this year, I realized there's something much deeper because this word image immediately took me to Revelation where in the end there's an image made to the beast and everyone who doesn't take the mark of this beast that this image has been made to will not be able to buy or sell. And how did angels deface the image of God in man? But by the transference of one, their own hybrid mixture, right? And knowledge that man shouldn't have had, this knowledge of good and evil. And so here, what are we seeing today? We're going to look at this. Remember these two concepts, the likeness of male or female, because there's a false likeness that's happening today and a false image. Revelation 14, 9 through 10 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So for the first time, we've always wondered, what is this image going to look like? Now we have deeper understanding through the vision of Yaakov that there is a false mixture being put into man. This is what is going to be a false image to the beast. In the past, remember throughout Daniel's dream, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel's interpretation of it, there was different beasts. There was Babylon represented by the lion, Medo-Persia represented by the bear, Greece was represented by a leopard with wings. All of these past world powers that controlled men, they were men controlling men. They were beast powers. They represent a world control over man. There's going to be a future world control over man, but instead of it being man controlling man, it's a false image. And we have to find out what this is. It says, Whoever takes this mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And Revelation 16, 2 goes on and says, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon all the men who had this mark of the beast upon them and worshipped the image. In some way, this image has become a form of idol worship to us. Our focus is so much on this image, we're spending more time with this image than we are with God. This is the essence of idol worship. So, in the Greek, what's interesting is the word for image is achone. And it's like where we, we say AI or icon. Uh, icon is an image, a uh, likeness, a representation, a re resemblance, or a replacement. So what is now replacing the past world's power of men controlling men, but this global brain, this artificial intelligence, this knowledge, this technology, which has been fused with man so much to the point where man is addicted to it, and they're starting to incorporate it into the genes of man. 
It's very interesting, very significant. And just to go back into a little history, where did this technology come from? Of course, we know it came from the fallen watchers, those who decided to procreate with the daughters of men. Genesis 6, 1 through 4 says, When men get, began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, they were fair, and they took them wives from whoever they chose. They basically took them by force. Jubilees 5, 1 through 2 says, And it came to pass, when the children of men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the angels of God saw them on a certain year of this jubilee, that they were beautiful to look upon. Now, it gives you the date exactly of when these watchers began to come down onto Mount Hermon. It was about 460 years after creation. And it tells uh, exactly how long and what they did. They took wives for themselves of anyone who they choose, and they bore unto them sons, and they were giants. So that first generation of offspring were called the great giants. The second generation were called the Nephilim, and there was a third generation before the flood called the Eloi. And lawlessness increased upon the earth, and all flesh corrupted its way. Now, the word for flesh is the same word for, like, mankind's genome. It was corrupted. And even cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walks on the earth, all of them corrupted their ways. So for the first image, the first DNA change was through the seeding of angelic beings with man. And this is what created not only giants, but then it goes on to say that they also taught the knowledge of how to mix animals with man. This is why you see in ancient pictures, and I'll show you a couple of them, um, the early gods, whether you're talking about the Greek gods, you know, who were men of renown, men of great strength, or the Egyptians gods who had, you know, wolf faces and hawk faces. This isn't just folklore. This is talking about the early angelic offspring who were hybrid beings and who men worshipped because they were in their image now. If, like the Sphinx, yeah, a good example of that. A lion with a human face. They taught humans about all sorts of technology, it says in Jubilees, and hybridization of species. In the book of Jasher, chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says that they set these giants and these hybrid beings up as their judges and as their rulers. Basically, the men realized that they were greater, they were advanced, and they not only worshipped them, but they made them rule over them. This is the what it's referring to here when it says, And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth and the beast of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order thereof to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt. You know, when it says that only Noah was found righteous in all his generation, in the Hebrew it has a connotation that he's the only one pure in all his lineage, in his DNA. All of the earth had been corrupted. Now remember, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be before the coming of the Son of Man. This means that there's a hybridization going on, but it might not be the exact way that they did it in the past. But it's going to reach the point where if time was not shortened, remember it says no flesh would survive, there's something insidious happening and we've been unaware of it. It's crept right up on us and all of us are involved with it. Even though we haven't been all contaminated, we're all just getting like the frog in the water used to having this hybridization all around us. The Watchers... Here you can see some ancient reliefs in some of the tombs. This is a Sumerian uh, tablet uh, that was found up in the north of uh, like Syria. This was found in Egypt. You can see all of the normal sized men bowing down, bringing offerings to this huge giant, right? The, the, that rules over them. And then he's got this little deceiver up here. They're worshiping the sun. Now in prophecy, Angels are represented by stars, which are suns. So it's no wonder that the source and focus of all pagan worship is sun worship. And why the worship of God has been transferred to the day of the sun, de solis in Latin, 
and people don't even realize its origins, how it's pointing to these false watchers. Yes, Archie. You talk about the giant. You always, I've always, I've never heard anybody talk about a female giant. Was any female or yeah, they procreated, um, but uh, yeah, there was male and female. But they, so the giants, of course, were the offspring of the angels who could have relations with man. But these giants had to also interbreed with one another to have a second generation who were slightly shorter than them, and the third generation slightly shorter. Did you have something, Carlos? No, you, I, uh, you know, I was thinking about the. Uh, uh, this uh, corruption of the sea, mm -hmm. gas and food. Because mm -hmm. I remember when I was little, you know, we're going to we talk about that. Bananas in, in my country. Yes. And they have seeds. That's right. Now and you don't. No, and uh, the other day, my wife told me, you remember that the bananas used to have seeds? Little black seeds in the middle. In my mind, I think, yeah, that's right. Now we are eating bananas with no seeds. That's right. So much food, that's called genetically modified food. This is a way that they're introducing the genes of animals back into the human population. So where maybe back then there was a different type of mixing the genome, today we're going to look at a few different ways that they're intermixing this advanced technology, and food is one of them. back to the on the ladder, there's 613 runs on that ladder. And that, that is a future. That, that whole scenario, one interpretation could be as a future prophecy of giving the Torah of Mount Sinai. Absolutely. Because that is the true restoration of the DNA of Hashem. This is His Word that's being given back to man. Now man lost the image of God through listening to the serpent in the Garden of Eden and took upon him this knowledge. What is technology but advanced knowledge, right? He took knowledge he shouldn't have had, the knowledge of good and evil. This was the beginning of it. God's been ever since trying to restore it. And the ultimate restoration will happen in the Millennial Kingdom kingdom very soon to come so Matthew 24 says for as we're in the days of Noah so will become so will it be before the coming of the Son of Man so we know whatever was happening then is got to be happening now but it's right under our noses we're blind to it Ephesians 6 12 says for we do not wrestle against flesh or blood but against rulers against authorities against cosmic powers over this present age this is a spiritual war and that's why it's not obvious. Against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So what's happening today? These watcher angels have been giving knowledge to man ever since. You know, in World War II, Hitler, when he disappeared, he didn't really die in the fire in, in Germany. He was seeking advanced knowledge from the offspring of these uh, angels with men and they gave him advanced knowledge of this is what you see today as UFOs uh, craft that can hover advanced technology circuitry um, computers all of these things and uh, he went underground to basically develop this technology and it has crept into society many people say they didn't really lose the war that it just went underground so that it could be more insidiously um, distributed amongst the population, yes. It's true it's out of the vehicles, and that was part of what came out in the big um, CIA uh, data a couple weeks ago when Trump, when Trump uh, released all of the hidden files that have been classified for so many years. They actually, the CIA has, had evidence that he was still alive down in uh, Argentina, I believe. Yes. In 1955, they actually have photos of him and so one of the forms of advanced technology, it's all self-focused, of course. It's to lengthen your life, right? Like, I'm going to be immortal, but without worshiping God, without serving Hashem, uh, I'm going to seek my own immortality. So these watchers, they know how to promote and lengthen life. And they, when they found out where these men, first they went to Antarctica, then they went to Argentina. And Hitler and uh, many of his generals, when they found them, many Many decades later, they still looked like they did back in the mid 40s. They hard, had hardly aged at all, which shows that that's part of that advanced technology. And I didn't even list that on this board, but I thought I'd give you a few examples of just areas where we see it creeping in. Yes. Yes, I, I was um, looking some of the information order about the nation technology. 
or they wanted just to do in their mind a nascent secret, secret society, mm -hmm. they invented robots. That's in every kind of, you know, flyers and stuff like that. Yeah. They wanted to eliminate a human being. That's called artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where we're going. Yeah. So they, that's why they're trying to kill a lot of people. Yeah, you'll still have the resources to work for you without the humans who eat up the resources. So the elite call the human beings useless feeders. Right? Because while they're necessary for us to stay on the top, in the future, they won't be. And right now, they look at us as use, eating up the resources of the earth that they want for their future uh, children, the future elite, and for themselves. And so it, human beings will be uh, phased out, and we're going to see that uh, coming up as well. So we have these different areas where we see mixing genetics with the human DNA through advanced technology. We mentioned genetically modified food. What about atmospheric geoengineering? They're spraying DNA, mixed DNA from the clouds. Now they're calling it atmospheric geoengineering, like, oh, there's global warming. We need to send out aluminum particulates, right, to reflect the heat of the earth back out into space. But with this spraying, they have found that there is human blood mixed with other kinds of blood. This is the DNA in, in nanoparticles, in microcosmic um, parts that you breathe in, basically, as it gets dispersed over the earth. Now this isn't to instill fear in anybody, this is just to be aware. I didn't even want to go into, I had no idea that the Lord was going to take us into this area and I felt kind of like Jonah, you know, really wrestling and going in different directions. No, I want to bring out something else in this Torah portion, but this uh, is, I guess is something that we need to be aware of because what it's going to do is help us prevent taking, you know, one, worshiping the image of the beast and taking the mark of the beast. So this is where all this is leading, but look at all the areas where it's, we're eating it, we're breathing it. We have scientists genetically fusing, like in your food, you have spider genes, food, uh, fish genes, like in the corn, you know, we know the Monsanto corn. Um, to overcome certain diseases, they're interjecting and growing human embryos with pig embryos and different things like this. So there's still animal human gene splicing and hybridization. But the big one and the focus of where the Lord really took me this week is how much technology is getting infused and integrated into the human life. And they call this artificial intelligence also known as transhumanism because it's reached a point where now they can couple it with your human genome. Do you know silicone is the closest chemical to carbon and we are, of all the things that we are, you know, we're oxygen and nitrogen and all that, but those are gases. If you really look at the matter of our cellular makeup, carbon is the majority of what we are and what can be fused most easily with carbon, but silicone. And what do they make computer chips with? Silicone. And you were going to say something, David? <laughs> One of the guys that I work with is now they have the technology, but they don't even attach keyboards anymore. They're, they have the chip. That's right. And, and they can actually think. Yes. While they're reading. And it types and it out. The, and the, and the, the computer is analyzing and collecting the data and returning data to them. Yep. Without without their involvement. I said to Karen after watching that, it sort of scared me. But and it's a young guy, a very young guy, very bright guy. Uh, I thought to myself, is this possible how they uh, create a willingness to accept? Yes. Look at our young people. Absolutely. They're grooming the next generation already. The millennials have grown up with cell phones. They're the first generation to grow up with cell phones. I didn't grow up with cell phones. I first cell phone I got was for business purposes and it was a tool for a purpose. But now the whole computer, your banking, you hold your cell phone up, you pay for things, uh, your medical history is on it. Um, every single thing, look at how people are attached. You're putting your own life into it, all your pictures telling the global brain and this artificial intelligence is computing all of the information that we're feeding into it and even we're going to look at even banking system the cryptocurrencies that have been created have you building bigger server farms and coding 
algorithms so that you can make money, right? Like Bitcoin, people have to do something to get a Bitcoin. What is it doing? It's actually building the global brain. The artificial intelligence have humans expanding the memory capacity and the algorithms and the formulas and, and we're basically working, but we'll, we'll look at this in a little bit. Um, so here's a, a, a um, quote from one of the scientists. He says, humans have carbon intelligence. Cognitive should take us from artificial intelligence to just silicone intelligence. So first your carbon-based uh, organic life form, silicone is inorganic, and they're moving you to integrate technology into your life. Next you put on glasses, right? And then you see everybody's name and it seems like it's helpful and you can get your advertisements and you can buy and sell and all of these things. Pretty soon it's, like David said, incorporated into your actual genome and, and, and chips onto your brain. And so it's a slippery slope where people that are addicted to technology don't even realize what they're doing to their children and what they're doing to themselves because are you going to be able to withstand letting go of technology when that day comes where the only way for us to not slide down that slippery slope is to start living more naturally and start detaching us from the faults. Yes? You know also, you know, the big thing here in the United States but also in Europe, mm -hmm. having um, Orders come in, you know, here on our borders of Muslims and the, and the Spanish, and having us mix and also marry, uh, same sex marriage, and on and on. But in Israel, the Zionists will not mix with the, for instance, right now, this week, 10,000 blacks in Israel have to leave Israel because they don't want them to mix with the blacks in Israel. Mm -hmm. And so they're leaving the country. They have to leave, but that's happening as we speak right now. Yeah. Like watching it. Revelation 13, 17 says, No man in the future will be able to buy or sell unless he takes this mark. This is economic, a form of economic control through this advanced technology. Now we know that already our, most of our purchases are done through debit cards, credit cards. They all have this chip in them. Pretty soon the chip's not going to be in the card, it's going to be in your hand. Um, so this global world power has this economic control. It says, save he that has the mark or the name. Now a name is always an identifier. Each of you have a number, right? This is your identifier. Instead of having a name which represents a characteristic of God, you are given an identifier and that the beast can recognize or the number of his name. Yes, Keith. Five years ago, Yeah, they're already testing this technology implanted in man. And there's a live testimony. Yep. I saw an article about Mark and how he was able to get the MARC military advanced. Oh, that's interesting. They're even playing in public with the symbolism and the name, like Mark, to be so obvious, or like we're going to look at the number of the name, uh, 666. There's an interesting thing about us being carbon-based life forms and this 666, and they're going to promote it. They're going to throw it out there because people are so blind to it. So we have finances, economic control. We have governmental control. Imagine you won't be able to cross borders without the government control. We have individual identifiers through technology. We have robots who are now getting citizenship to other countries so that they can be taxed. The first robot named Sophia, which is Greek for wisdom or knowledge, this wrong knowledge, has been granted citizenship by Saudi Arabia because they see the future of the money. Now here's what we're made up of, human carbon life forms, and 99% of the body's made up of just six elements, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Out of these six, um, well these are four mentioned here, um, then we have phosphorus and potassium, but carbon is the only matter that's not a gas. Okay, and you can see that 18% is actually carbon. So this is what's left when you see people um, cremated or if like in a nuclear explosion you see a little pile of dust. It's mostly the carbon. 
carbon and silicon are side by side on the periodic table. They have some differences, such as silicon, silicon being an inorganic compound, and carbon is an organic compound, but they're almost twins, which is amazing. Uh, carbon is the element of life form. Now, remember back before the flood, the fallen angels were giving knowledge of what was called alchemy, how to manipulate metals and chemicals and molecular structures of things to men. This was one of the knowledge that they were giving them. So who would know better that these things are compatible? And do we think it's just chance that all of our technology, all of our computers are based upon a silicone platform? Carbon's the element of life forms playing a major role in the metabolic processes, while silicone is an element of the machines, serving as a major component for parts such as semiconductors. When you look at the carbon molecule, what's interesting is it has six electrons, six protons, and six neutrons. We are basically 6666. Six, six is the number of man. It is going to be falsely um, counterfeited, if you will. So the 666 is the number of not a man, but the number of man in Revelation. And this is what the enemy is counterfeiting. He's taking our true molecular makeup, the way God created us in his image, and splicing in a hybrid technology. I'll wait till you take that <laughs> picture. Very interesting for me. <laughs> yeah. Look at this. This was uh, a chart done by a evolutionist, okay? Now, if you don't believe in God, you're not going to have the same take on it as I'm going to have, seeing that there's a rebellion against God. There's a concerted effort to deface the image of God. You're just going to look at it as a process of evolution. This is the next phase of evolution. So we started out as single-cell amoebas, and we went through replication and polymerization, and then metabolism started uh, in, as the cells started multiplying in the RNA and the cell membranes uh, increased. And then you have uh, DNA being seen on the evolutionary chain. And then uh, cellular life forms, neural networks, you know, which is the brain being created. So now they're actually thinking instead of being inanimate single cell organisms, they're actually able to have cognitive awareness. And then um, you come down into starting to recognize yourself, recognize others, having social behavior and interaction. And then you start creating something like yourself, but it's an image to yourself. It's a replica. This is what artificial intelligence is. This is what robots are. And so you think that they're going to help you. Hey, I can have somebody that I can't, I can have work for me and I can have do things that might harm them without the moral complications of sending a human being into maybe a gaseous um, mine, let's say, right? Or to um, b banking is using uh, artificial intelligence right now. There's so much things that men has thought, well, I will create this technology for myself for, to stay on the top. And, and yet what happens is it slowly takes over the human aspect and that's all that's left. So right now we're at the bio-digital fusion uh, place where it's intermixed together. But eventually, what the scientists and the astro engineers are saying is that the way of the future is not carbon silicone mixed, but only silicone. Basically, artificial intelligence taking over. Uh, they're already computing them uh, on their own and uh, have a certain awareness of themselves. So here we see this mixture that's got the image of man, and yet it is not man. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 666, Revelation 13, 18. Carbon, six electrons, six protons, six neutrons. And we see that this word for the number of man is actually anthropos, which means man-faced or like human uh, being, mankind. So it's the number of mankind that's being counterfeited, not just the number of everybody's looking for a single man. This is uh, Paul McCready, and he's an astro-engineer that helped um, develop a lot of different kinds of um, 
flying ships and technology for flying ships. He says the surviving intelligent life form on Earth is not going to be carbon-based. It's going to be silicon-based. Of course, we know the Lord has another plan, right? As in the days of Noah, if time was not shortened, no flesh would survive. But this is the scientific, uh, atheistic, secular mindset that's... Uh, you know the way they are teaching universities is uh, how you can... Uh, um, Compute more, or? more in, um, uh, uh, grab in, in your mind. So the first time you are exposed to their teaching is the teacher goes and goes into the um, blackboard. Mm -hmm. That's the first time you are exposed to information. That's right. And then the second times through the books. Uh -huh. they give you the books, and then you go and read the books. First, you hear the teacher yeah. saying at the blackboard. Second, you are exposed to reading for yourself. And believing it. And the third, the third um, time is when you go to the test. So your mind can, oh, okay, the teacher said, I read it, and now here is my And you test. believe it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So how we are exposed to know God? The same way. To the reading of the world. That's the thing. We want to make God's people aware of what's happening insidiously and separate themselves to be able to, like Carlos is saying, hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and focusing on reading God's Word. In so way, by beholding His character through His Word, we become changed back into His likeness. But if we are on the phone all the time and going to Facebook all the time and so self-focused, integrating technology to the point where we can't put it down at dinner time or we can't talk to anybody without having checking our cell phone, then when the next phase of technology comes, it's just going to be another gadget to go get at Best Buy, you know? It's, and then pretty soon it's go down to the doctor and get it infused in you. This is the way that it's moving. And I think God wants his people to know that now's the time to start weaning yourself off of it. Don't go down that slippery slope where then you think, oh, well, I'll reject it when it reaches the point of taking the mark of the beast. We have to separate ourselves from this hybridization. We see it in government, in economics, in religion, in technology, in nanotechnology, in you giving all of your life information and be dependent on all of your life information. We see from the beginning, Nimrod was seeking advanced knowledge. He became a mighty man. He was ruling over the whole world. The first one world government was him focused on building a portal to get more advanced technology, this Tower of Babel, which back in the Beijing um, Olympics, they built an image basically showing that this is what the elite are moving back towards, a portal where they can have this advanced technology, this advanced knowledge, and they're selling their soul to do it. The Beast Power has tried to create in its own interdimensional portals to gain access to more knowledge. We see it with the Watchers before the Flood, then at the Tower of Babel, and then, more recently, the EU building has patterned itself after the unfinished ziggurat, which we call the Tower of Babel. This is uh, in Europe. They had this old picture painted in the 1700s that they asked their architects to design the EU building after, because this is the plan of the EU to go back to being gods, being hybrid gods. This is what the first gods of Greek mythology were. Their motto, you know, God changed everyone from being one people in one language at that time. There was many different peoples in one tongue, and he confused the tongues there at Babel. Their motto is an in-your-face uh, assault on God, kind of like with the harbinger, where he says, we're going to build and we're going to build better. You know, it's like, no matter what you've done, God, we're going to reverse it in our own power. Same way Europe's motto was many tongues now, so you confused our language, but we're going to be one voice against you. One voice ruling ourselves. One voice in a one-world government. So it's going back, even the language, to the Tower of Babel. And this was the flag that was flown as they were building this um, EU Parliament building. This was their uh, kind of marketing, if you can believe it. We see even more recently this 666, that's this fusion of technology with human DNA in 
wanting to open another portal, a more modern day par portal is in Geneva, Switzerland. This CERN, they call it the Hydron Collider, and it's a 17 mile loop where they're blasting atoms into each other, hoping to o open a, a rift or create a tear in the space time continuum and allow these ancient spirits, these demonic spirits that have been held in judgment up until this day, to give them more knowledge. And this is what Revelation talks about. Remember, it says something opened up like a pit, and something like uh, unclean spirits, like frogs, came up out of it. This is happening in our day. Google, which is the kind of facilitator of all the AI brain's knowledge, um, everything that you're searching, everything that people are putting in in their websites. This is the new Google Chrome logo. Now look at CERN. You got 666 in the CERN logo. Blatant to the world. Chrome, 666. Right there, very obvious. Almost identical to the CERN. It's all about a portal to knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. Here's another uh, interesting correlation. The W's in Hebrew would be likened unto Vav's. And Vav is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now remember, Vav always represents man. It's the one letter that looks like it's a standing and upright man. Six. What's that? Yeah. Yes, he's standing up. So you can see the technology. These different symbols are right in our face every day. They're saying advanced technology comes from this source and it's leading to this in image to the beast and to its mark. Apple, its original logo, was about that forbidden fruit, the knowledge of good and evil from the tree. Barcoding, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. You know, every barcode has a different number, but they are spaced apart by a six and a six and a six. And you can see different widths, right? Represent different numbers. Here's a six, what it looks like. It's two lines of equal width right here. Here's a shorter six. So you can even see it within the code here, but every barcode has this six, six, six basically saying that everything is going digital and you're not going to be able to buy or sell. Everything is tracked um, through this artificial intelligence. Banking is now reached a stage where the AI is having us create server farms and, and um, what they call, how does it call, block uh, chain computing. And this is the way in the very near future everybody is going to even if you're in Africa or in India or in a village everybody now has a cell phone first they made sure that everybody around the world had a cell phone and I remember the years that I used to go in the African Serengeti and I would walk with the Maasai warriors and all we'd have is a shield and a machete and maybe a little stick you know and then I came back the following years and all of a sudden they still dress the same still have their spear and their shield and but they got a cell phone on their hip. They're making sure that everybody has access, even if they have to give them away for free, get you connected. And they're getting money when you send them donations or when they'll ask you uh, for your information. Yeah. It's all, their whole life is now on the phone. Surveillance, another way. You know, the global brain watching everything that you're doing, learning, imitating from you. It sounds like something of a sci-fi movie, but this all was being revealed to Yaakov about the pure DNA that God's holy angels are supposed to ascend and descend on. What were the purpose of angels? As messengers of his knowledge. When angels go rogue and they're in rebellion, they still ascend and descend on the DNA, but in mutating it and creating it after their image and giving the wrong kind of information, which they know is going to create an eternal separation. In essence, if we're lost, you're going to be lost with us. We're going to take the children of God. If you want to hurt somebody, you don't just kill them. You hurt their children, and you know that that hurts them the greatest. So we see this amazing time that we're living in where people are literally... Yeah breaking apart the DNA, the image of God in man um, for their own selfish purposes and to follow after that which was promoted in, since ancient times by these fallen beings. So a little symbolism and then we'll go back into the Torah portion. Uh, as we do a little midrash, we'll take a little break from looking at that AI. 
there's an interesting symbolism of Jacob as the ladder and Messiah as being in the ladder. Now remember Messiah was in the loins of Jacob. And we have a prophecy back in Genesis 3.15. Remember it says, The serpent shall bruise his heel, but he shall crush his head, right? So Yaakov represents Messiah in the reminder of the heel prophecy. Basically, we always talk about Messiah being pointed at as bru bruising the, the Satan's head. But Yaakov and his pure lineage, his pure DNA, will be the overcomers of sin, of which Messiah Yeshua was just an example for us. And as overcomers, it's that which truly crushes Satan's head. Remember, if Satan's head was crushed at the cross, we wouldn't be tempted right now, right? We wouldn't be going through what we're going through. But Romans 16.20 says, The God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet as the descendants of Jacob. So we see a dual prophecy here. And of course, Yaakov means the heel. And when it's referring to the serpent bruising Messiah's heel, you can see Yaakov hinted at. Yaakov's in Messiah. Messiah's in Yaakov. Now there's a principle of the Yaqid son as the second son, as Messiah is the second Adam, who comes in the pureness of the word and who teaches us how to overcome where the first Adam failed. Jacob was the second son. He was the Yaqid son. Yaqid kind of means beloved or chosen son. Regardless of who's the firstborn, you're the one worthy to carry on the priestly lineage. And we see Jacob resembles Messiah in being the second, as the first Adam was fleshly, so was Esau. So the second Jacob wars against the first. Enmity between man-centered and God-centered. Are we going to allow God to create us back into his image of selfless love? Or are we going to constantly feed the self through self-gratification? And that's something that technology does. It's immediate gratification in every area. Boom, I don't have to grow the food. I can just go and buy it. I don't have to go and visit the person. I can just text them. I, you know, everything is about self. And this is what we want to get away from. Esau symbolizes God's enemies who are self-focused. If Jacob resembles Messiah, then Esau resembles God's enemies. Jacob resembles Messiah in his conflict with the flesh. And we know God's enemies in the last days are using this advanced technology to work against God's people. You won't be able to buy or sell unless you're part of our global system. Now, let's turn to John 1, and we will read an interesting uh, analogy of this ladder that Yeshua speaks of himself. John 1.49 says, Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Did you know Nathanael called Yeshua Rabbi? So if you got anything against the rabbis, <laughs> or the term rabbi, is a common phrase for the last 2,000 years. He calls him Son of God. He's recognizing he's the second Adam. And future king of Israel. So you have current, and you have past, and you have future. Yeshua answered and said to him, Because I say unto thee, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe me? Thou shalt see even greater things than these. He's basically saying, You wondered because I told you that I saw you in the spirit realm, even before I physically saw you, and you are calling me the Son of God because of that. In the future, you're going to see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So he's basically refer taking his mind back to, because Nathaniel studied Torah, he knew this story of Yaakov's vision of the ladder, and he's saying, I am the Word. The Word is the seed. The image of God is in me. This is what you're to be recreated in. I'm the ladder. Future King of Israel will restore the image of God in man and be the foundation. See, even the significance of being the heel that gets bruised, he's the foundation, he's the cornerstone, the support heel of Israel. The Greek word is basileus, which means a basis, uh, the foot. And this is what he's calling him. Through the nation, the foundation of power, whether abstractly, relatively, or figuratively, God gave this prophecy of Messiah through Yaakov as being the heel, the support of Israel. Our heels support us. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, Israel's, the foundation's heel. 
so the enemy is only going to do a temporary uh, wound to Israel. But it's through Israel that the serpent's head is ultimately crushed by overcoming the need for self and the self-focus. By being the selfless love that God's DNA uh, creates, we fulfill this prophecy. So Messiah is just a type of what we are to be. Romans 16, 20 says, And the God of peace, remember, he's not the God of violence. He's not the God of killing, the God of crushing. He does this through us. It's through our obedience. The God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet because we are the descendants of Yaakov, the heel, the support. The grace of our anointed Messiah, our Master Yeshua be with you. Amen. But how? The next verse reveals. He's speaking of obedience without any mixture. Look at this. He says, For they are such that serve not our Master Yeshua, but their own belly. He's bringing out the self. This has been hidden in the Brit Hadashah all of these years. And by good works and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the innocent. For your obedience spreads forth abroad to all men as an example. Just like Yeshua was an example for us. Us being the selfless love and the change we want to see in the world and the resistance to getting sucked into this mixture of technology with humanness. We have to be an example to the world. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet, I would have you wise, this is the right kind of knowledge, in that which is only good. See the difference from the beginning? The enemy's intent has been to give you a knowledge of good mixed with evil. Just like there's been a hybridization of their seed with God's seed. And now technology, advanced technology with us. There's always this mixture. Good with evil, light with darkness. It's always been promoted. But God would have us only eat from the tree of life, which is only the knowledge of good, of light, of love, of that which leads to life and life more abundantly. And he says, and simple, this word means unmixed. Basically, unmixed concerning evil. This is exactly what Paul is bringing out. Let's stop being like the world. We have to be in the world, but let's stop being mixed by the influence of the world. Yes? You know the, the, um, the worst thing today is to eat animal products. Why? Because what you were showing, they are mixing uh, silicon mm -hmm. with the animal. And this is That's very, true too. In addition to the animal genes, milk, there's silicone. Cheese and cream and butter. Terrible. I, I, I was saying for myself, That's a good point. and I was praying to my father, Father, we are eating even um, and clean food, even vegetables and fruit. That's right. But what is going to be worse than animal products? That's why God would have us leave wow, the cities and the places that are highly controlled by this agenda and go back to his ways in nature and be growing our own food and living without the yeah. um, control of technology and the addiction to it. Very good point. Yeah. And they're putting it in in such a way that like the frog in the water, by the time you realize the water's gotten hot, it's too late and you can't jump out. Yeah. So going back to the Torah portion, Yaakov awoke from his sleep and he called the place the temple or the house of God. And he took this stone, this ebon, and he sets it up as a standing stone, a pillar, and he pours olive oil on its head. He's basically anointing it, just like a, a future Mashiach will be anointed. And he named the place House of God. But that area had originally been called Luz. And Luz is uh, an almond tree in the Hebrew. It's interesting, in Espanol, uh, luz means light, right? He had a little epiphany of light, yeah. but uh, this is the origin of the word luz. It comes from the almond, which is the first to bloom. So the true knowledge is uh, like us blooming in the true knowledge of God and his goodness, but not the mixture of good and evil. That's the true light. Lucifer has... In, yeah, insidiously mixed good with evil and caused men to, that's what the occult is all about, power for self alone through this wrong knowledge. 
So Yaakov took this vow. If God will be with me and guard me on this road that I am traveling, giving me bread to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return to my father's house in peace, then Adonai will be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a standing stone, will be God's house. And of everything you give me, I will faithfully return one-tenth to you. This will be the cornerstone of the future temple as well. It was the cornerstone of, of Solomon's temple, and uh, it will be used by Mashiach as well. Continuing his journey, Yaakov came to the land of the people of the east, and as he looked, he saw a well in the field. Now what's happened between this dream and him coming to this well where he meets Rachel is Esau sends Eliphaz to kill him. Eliphaz, his firstborn son, is 13 years old, and he takes with him a bunch of, of his dad's troops, basically, to come kill his dad. And Jacob says, do not do this thing that's going to bring a curse upon you. You can take the wealth, because he knows Esau's focus is physically focused. It's materially focused. So Jacob was going with the inheritance from his father, great wealth, to take a wife. It wasn't intended that he should be up there 22 years. He was supposed to go get a wife until Esau's anger was appeased, and then come right back to his family. So you go for a wife, just like, remember, Abraham sent uh, Eliezer with great riches, and you give a dowry for this child who's worthy to be the wife of your master's son. Well, Jacob's up there with the dowry, with all of this money from his father, and yet he, to save his own life, offers it to Eliphaz. Take this wealth, Eliphaz. And it's most likely at this point that Eliphaz had the garment, that priestly garment that had been passed down from Adam that, Eliph that Esau had taken from Nimrod. And most likely there was an exchange there that happened. He took the wealth, but all Jacob was left with was with this garment. And so he shows up and sees Rachel by the well and falls in love with her. But he has nothing to offer Laban as a dowry. So this is why he offered to work for seven years for Rachel's hand in marriage. And he sees her there, and he gets this supernatural strength. You know, there's a stone over the well to keep uh, anybody from using the water except the people that, whose well it is. And only when all the flocks had gathered around, men would together roll away this uh, stone from the opening of the well. And then they would put it back in its place when all the sheep had been watered. And Rachel was there watering her father's sheep. And she was the only one. Not everybody had gathered around, so the other men weren't there ready. But Jacob by himself moves the stone off of the well to water Rachel's sheep. Yaakov said to them, My brothers, where are you from? They answered, We are from Haran. He asked them, Do you know Laban, the grandson of Nahor? They said, We do. He asked them, are things going well with him? Yes, they answered. And here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. He said, look, there's plenty, there's still plenty of daylight left, and it isn't time to bring the animals home. So water the sheep, then go and put them out to pasture. They answered, we can't, not until all the flock has been gathered together. And they roll the stone away from the opening of the well. That's when we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep because she took care of them. When Yaakov saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Yaakov went up and rolled the stone away from the opening of the well himself and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Yaakov kissed Rachel and wept aloud. Imagine how much he had gone through from leaving his father's house to almost losing his life to losing all of his possessions and then seeing this girl who he knows God has for his future progeny to carry on the seed, the priestly lineage. And he wept. And Yaakov told Rachel that he was her father's relative, that he was Rivka's son, and she ran and told her father. When Laban heard the news of Yaakov, his sister's son, he ran out to meet him. Now remember, last time that he saw somebody from Abraham's household was Eliezer, with great wealth and camels and riches, right? And he profited off of that. So no wonder he's going to run out and see you know, who has come now to, to bless his household again. He can keep selling these daughters off. So Laban heard the news, and he runs out to meet him. He hugs him and kisses him and brings him into his house. Yaakov told Laban all that had happened. 
what do you think he talked about? All that had happened. Interesting sentence, isn't it? Short, sweet, and Yaakov told him all that had happened. He must have started back, you know, how the story began, back with deceiving his father and getting the blessing, but then losing the blessing to Eliphaz, uh, son of Esau, who was the eldest. And so he comes there, and he has nothing to offer for his daughter. And this is leading up to why I need to work for you for seven years to get her hand, because now I have nothing. Laban, who's an Arami, the Aram means trickster, and we know Laban was a trickster, is internalizing all of this and thinking, okay, you work for me for seven years, and when he tricks uh, Yaakov and gives Yaakov the firstborn, which is Leah, instead of Rachel, he says, it's just not done that way here. We don't give things to the younger. He's basically mocking him. You deceived your father. You're the younger. You took the inheritance by deceit. Now I'm deceiving you. And I'm giving you the older. What you sow, you reap. Huh? Yes, what you sow, you reap. Wow. It's so true. And we're going to see that again in this Torah portion over and over. It happens in the DNA. It happens with the words we speak and the actions. And with the sheep in the future, when we see Laban's sheep multiplying because they look at this striped pole, it's also what we look at, what we behold. So constantly through this Torah portion, the common theme is... What you sow, you reap. It's all about the seed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So Yaakov stayed with him for a whole month. And Laban said to him, Why should you work for me for nothing, just because you're my relative? Tell me how much I should pay you. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel's were good-looking, with beautiful features. Yaakov had fallen in love with Rachel and said, I will work for you seven years in exchange for Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban answered, Better I give her to you than to someone else. Stay with me. So Yaakov worked seven years for Rachel, and it seemed only a few days to him because he was so much in love with her. Yaakov said to Laban, Now the time has come. Give me my wife since my time is finished so that I can start living with her. Laban gathered all the men of the place and gave a banquet. He got Jacob drunk. This is a little bit of the rest of the story. And as many feasts and banquets go, you know, the bride is veiled. And he gets Jacob drunk so he won't realize who he's sleeping with when they go into the hoopah, into the marriage chamber. <coughs> Laban gathered all the men of the place and gave a big feast. And in the evening, he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Yaakov. The people, as they were singing songs, it's very traditional to sit around the fire and to dance and to sing. And the people of the area knew Laban's trickery and knew that he had covered up Leah. And they were putting in the lyrics of the songs, Leah, 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 kind of trying to hint, you know, let him know, this is Leah that you're about to go into the hoopah with, but he didn't get it. And he went into the hoopah and uh, slept with uh, Leah. And Laban also gave his slave girl, Zilpah, to his daughter as a maidservant. So, in essence, he gets two wives, and neither of them are the one that he's in love with. In the morning, Yaakov saw that he was with Leah, and he said to Laban, What kind of thing is this you've done to me? He's indignant, right? Didn't I work for you, for Rachel? How, how, why have you deceived me? He uses the same word that Yitzhak used before when Esau came to him and said, Father, I have the, the stew for you. And he goes, I've been deceived. Your brother came and deceived me. So this is mirroring Isaac's words in Genesis 27, verse 35. Laban answered, In our place, this isn't how it's done, to give the younger before the older. He's mocking him, and he's telling him, you're going to be deceived, and you're going to reap what you sow. And in essence, he works another seven years for Rachel, even though he gives Rachel right then to him, but he, they make an agreement that he'll work. So now he's got three wives. After the week that's allotted to be with your wife, that next week he took Rachel into his tent and, and slept with her. So now he's got three wives. And Rachel's handmaiden was given to Jacob as well. So he's got four, right? The 12 tribes of Israel come from four different women. And uh, he ends up working another seven years. That's 14 years. But he still has no wealth. He only has these women. He works another seven years for the wealth, right? They make this agreement. 
So in essence, it's 22 years before he actually leaves, and it's the same amount of time that he's away from his father that Joseph, when Joseph is taken away by the Ishmaelites, sold into slavery by his brothers, Jacob doesn't see his beloved son 22 years, just like he deprived from his trickery, his father and mother from being in close proximity with them. Then exact parallel there, that which you sow, you shall also reap. Yes, you had a question? Correct. At that time, they're only given to serve uh, the daughters of Laban. So, kind of like servants, they stay with the person, they serve them all the days of their life. Oftentimes, it was a custom where these women, when they couldn't bear children, would give their handmaiden and to be impregnated by their husband to keep bearing children because that was a sign of status. When they would have the child, they would sit in a special chair and that handmaiden would sit on their lap and birth through their legs, symbolizing that it's not their children, it's you know their master's children. And so you're right, it's the daughters who later give. So he's not sleeping with the handmaidens at this point. He, they are given to them later when the Leah and Rachel are not bearing children. So, Laban has deceived Yitzhak, and there's an exact parallel to this deception of the past. Yaakov agreed to work another seven years, and Laban gave his daughter Rachel as his wife. Laban also gave to his daughter Rachel his maidservant Billa as her maidservant. Not only did Yaakov go in and sleep with Rachel, but he also loved Rachel more than Leah. Then he served Laban another seven years. Adonai saw that Leah was unloved, so he made her fertile first, while Raquel remained childless. Leah conceived and gave birth to a son. In this way, she would get attention and love from, from Jacob. And she named the firstborn Reuven. This is where we get Reuben from. It means see, a son. Re in Hebrew is see, and bain, bin, is son. So you basically have see the son. So this is what she named her firstborn. And she said, It is because Adonai has seen how humiliated I've been, but now my husband will see me and love me. She conceived again and gave birth to a son. And she said, It's because Adonai has heard that I'm unloved, therefore he's given me this son also. So she named him Shimon, which means hearing, because God heard her prayers about wanting her husband's love. Once more she conceived, and she had a son, and she named him um, Le Levi, because Lev is heart, so it's like my heart. Now this time my husband will be joined to my heart because I have borne him three sons, so I'm going to name this thirdborn my heart, Levi. So with four wives, in essence, how many would each one, if there was going to be equality, be, what would be a fair amount of children for each one to have? You got 12 sons of Israel that are going to come through four wives, so three sons for each woman. So watch what happens when Leah gets more than even her share from Hashem. Very interesting. So, let's see, we left off with Levi. Verse 35, she conceived yet again and had a fourth son, and she named him Thankfulness. This is what Judah represents. Judah has always been so thankful to God's Torah. They've lived up to their name. They've, the name is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. She named him thankfulness because she got more than she even deserved. She got a fourth son. So, she conceived yet again and had a son. And she said, this time I will thank the Lord and praise him. Therefore, she named him Yehuda, which means thankful or praise. Then she stopped having children. When Raquel saw that she was not bearing children for Yaakov, she envied her sister and said to Yaakov, Give me children or I will die. Now talk about sowing seeds. We've looked at different aspects of sowing seed, right? Now she's verbalizing something. She's putting it out into the ether. And when our thoughts are connected with our hearts and we speak things into existence, because we're created in the image of God as co-creators. So this is why our words are so powerful. Don't even joke like that. Oh, I feel I'm so hungry I could. You know what people say. She's saying, give me children or I might as well be dead. 
this is the first witness against herself, against death. She's going to have a second witness. She's speaking useless words, and the second time that she says this, it actually comes to pass. These are hidden principles within the Torah. The second time was when she said she had hidden her father's idols, remember, and she was sitting on them, and she was saying, uh, I think it was Jacob who said, whoever is found with the idols, let them die. And so he acted as a double witness. She was already a first witness against herself, and she died a little bit later in childbirth on the way past Jerusalem uh, with Benjamin. So this made Yaakov angry at Rachel. Sometimes when you know people are speaking words that are going to harm themselves, you become impassioned, you know. Don't speak like that. Can I control what's happening? Am I in God's place? He's the one who's denying you children. She said, Here is my handmaid Billah. Go sleep with her and let her give birth to a child that will be laid on my knees, so that through her I too can build a family. So she gave him Billah, her slave girl, as his wife, and Yaakov went in and slept with her. And Billah conceived and bore Yaakov a son. Rachel said, God has judged in my favor now. So which son do you think this is? Dan means judgment. And indeed he has heard me and given me a son. Therefore she called him Don, which means he judged. Now Billah, Rachel's slave girl, conceived again and bore ya Yaakov a second son. And Rachel said, I have wrestled mightily with my sister, and now I'm winning. So she called him Naphtali, which meant my wrestling. When Leah saw again she had stopped having children, and she saw that Rachel's handmaiden was giving Yaakov children, she gave her handmaiden also, whose name was Billah. And Zilpah, Leah's slave girl, bore Yaakov a son. And Leah said, Good fortune has come back to me. So she called him Good Fortune, which is God in Hebrew. So it's kind of like when we say we don't like to say good luck, we don't believe in good luck because we're blessed, right, by Hashem. Through the diaspora, the tribes of God became known for one of the tribes of Israel and the worshipers of the one true Elohim. And over time, the Elohim of God became known as God. This is how why we call Elohim God to this day. It's kind of like saying the source of our luck or our good fortune God. So it, this is the etymology of words through the years. Call, nations became uh, to come, come to know God's God, you know, God's Elohim. And of course pagans look at God's as the source of luck, right? It's more luck. It's not about living right so that you will enter into blessings and they don't realize the loss of blessings is due to them not living right. They all think, okay, well, if I do this more, if I, you know, sacrifice my children to this angry God, then I'll have better luck. Or if I do this, I'll have better crops. And so it's funny how good fortune and luck has become associated with pagan God. Zilpah, Leah's slave girl, bore Yaakov a second son, and Leah said, How happy I am. Women will say that I'm happy. And so she named him Asher, which means happy or blessed. Now during the wheat harvest, which we know is Shavuot time, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. This was known as uh, a fertility um, helper. Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes so that I can be fertile. She answered, Isn't it enough that you've taken away my husband? Do you have to take away my son's mandrakes too? Rachel said, Very well. In exchange for your son's mandrakes, you can sleep with him tonight. So when Yaakov came in from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you have, come, you, have come, you have to come and sleep with me because I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So Yaakov slept with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Yaakov a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my hire because I gave my slave girl to my husband. So she called him Yisachar, which means hired or reward. Now, Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Yaakov. And Leah said, God has given me a wonderful gift. Now at last my husband will live with me since I have borne him six sons. And she called him Zebulon, which means living together. After this, she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dina. Because Dina, like Dan, kind of means judgment. It's from that same root word, but it's because there was a controversy at that time. And, and there needed to be judgment between this controversy. So it's kind of like Dina means controversy over one's rights. 
Then God took note of Rachel, heeded her prayer, and made her fertile again. She conceived and had a son, and said, God has taken away my disgrace. So she called him Yosef, which means may he add, or added, saying, may God add to me another son. After Rachel had given birth to Yosef, Yaakov said to Laban, Send me on my way so that I can return back to my own people, to my own country. Let me take my wives for whom I have served you and my children and let me go. You know very well how faithfully I have served you. Laban answered him, If you regard me favorably, then please listen. I have observed the signs that Adonai has blessed me on account of you. Name your wages now. So he's done working for wives. He's basically saying, now let me pay you, but stay with me because I recognize the source of my blessing is you. I will pay whatever you ask. Yaakov replied, you know how faithfully I have served you and how your livestock has prospered under my care. The few you had before I came have increased substantially. Adonai has blessed you wherever I went, but now when will I provide for my own household? Laban said, what should I give you? Nothing, answered Yaakov. Just do this one thing for me. Once more I will pasture your flock and take care of it. I will also go through the flock and pick out every speckled, spotted, or brown sheep, and every speckled or spotted goat. These and their offspring will be my wages, and I will let my integrity stand as a witness against me in the future. When you come to look over the animals, constituting my wages, every goat that isn't speckled or spotted, and every sheep that isn't brown will count as stolen by me. So basically, if we're going to cohabitate like Lot and Abraham did, and we have these massive flocks, you'll be able to tell which ones are mine, very obviously, and which ones are yours. Laban replied, as it is said, so be it. So that day, Laban removed the male goats that were streaked or spotted. He's trying to sabotage Jacob's prospering. And all the female goats that were speckled or spotted, every one with white on it and all the brown sheep, turned them over to his sons and put three days' distance between himself and Yaakov. And Yaakov fed the rest of Laban's flocks. So he only gives them the solid colored ones because he knows they're only going to procreate solid ones. He's purposely sabotaged him so that his wealth will grow and Jacob's will not. Yaakov had amazing knowledge in the spiritual realm. He had learned from Melchizedek. He learned the principle of that which we behold, we become like. So he took fresh cut branches from the popular almond and plane trees and made white streaks in them by peeling off the bark. Then he set the rods he had peeled upright in the watering trough so that whenever the animals would come to drink, they would be looking at these striped and speckled rods. And as they are uh, coming together to procreate, whatever they're looking at affects what is in their womb. And they actually have spotted and speckled and striped babies. When the animals mated in the sight of the rods, they gave birth to these spotted, speckled, and streaked young. Yaakov divided the lambs and had the animals mate with the streaked and the brown in the flock of Laban. He also kept his own livestock separate and did not have them mix with Laban's flock. Whenever the hardy animals came into heat, Yaakov would set up the rods in the watering troughs, so that way not only was it just any animal, but it would be the stronger of the flock. But he didn't set the rods up in front of the weaker animals. In this word weak, it's interesting, there's an enlarged pay, so feet. And let's see, I didn't write it on the whiteboard, but I think I put it up here. Throughout the year, I've shown you different enlarged letters that are anomalies that bring out deeper significance. And here's the pay, so feet, in the word for weaker. It's the final pay. And you can see that this word is a primitive root to clothe or to shroud. Uh, to cover the feebler and the enlarged pay, which a pay is like a face. Basically, you know, like when God's speaking to Moshe, it's panim el panim, face to face. Well, this enlarged pay is showing us that there is great power in understanding that by beholding, we become changed into that same likeness. So God is telling us, be careful what you're spending your time focused on. Are we spending more time, to go back to that analogy of the latter and the hybridization of advanced technology in our lives today, are we spending more time with this counterfeit, with this advanced technology? Technology? 
or are we spending more time in God's Word and being recreated in His image? There's a lesson even in this. If we focus on the wrong, we're going to become feeble. If we be focused on the original, in the source, in our Creator, we'll become strong. So there's a hidden lesson even right here. The more feeble were Laban's, and the strongers were Yaakov's. In this way, the man became very rich and had large flocks, along with male and female slaves, camels, and donkeys. Now, in this last chapter, we see the story of Yaakov pulling away from Laban, and the power of Rachel's words being made manifest, what happens. So then he heard what Laban's sons were saying about his wealth and the, their jealousy. And Yaakov, they would say, has taken away everything that our father once had. It's from what used to belong to our father that he's gotten so rich. So this jealousy he knew would be a problem. He also saw that Laban regarded him differently now than before because of this jealousy. So Adonai said to Yaakov, Return to the land of your ancestors, to your kinsmen, and I will be with you. So Yaakov sent for Rachel and Leah, and had them come to the field where his flocks were. And he said to them, I see by the way your father looks at me, he feels differently toward me than before. But the God of my father has been with me. You know that I've served your father with all my strength, and that your father has belittled me and changed my wages ten times. Just like Abraham was tested ten times, Jacob was tested ten times. And yet he was faithful to his word. But God did not allow him to do me any damage. If he said, the speckled will be your wages, then all the animals gave birth to speckled young. And if he said, the streaked will be your wages, then all the animals gave birth to streaked young. This is how God has taken away your father's animals and given them to me. Once when the animals were mating, I had a dream. I looked up, and there in front of me, the male goats, which mated with the females, were streaked, speckled, and mottled. Then in the dream, the angel of God said to me, Yaakov, and I replied, Hineni, here I am. He continued, Raise your eyebrows now and look. Behold, all the male goats, goats mating with the females are streaked, speckled, and spotted. For I have seen everything Laban has been doing to you. So God's watching Laban, and he's telling Yaakov to focus on the sheep's attention on the, the spotted and the speckled so that they would become like that which they look at. We no longer have any inheritance here from our father's possessions, Rachel and Leah answered him. He considers us foreigners since he gave us to you. Moreover, he has consumed everything he received in exchange for us. So he was living lavishly and he had already spent all of this wealth that Jacob had made for him. And nevertheless, the wealth which God has taken away from our father has become ours and our children's anyway. So whatever God has told you to do, do. Then Yaakov got up and put his sons and his wives on the camels and carried off all his livestock, along with all the riches he had accumulated, the livestock in his possessions, which he had acquired in Padam Aram. This is the plain of trickery, in essence. Padam Aram means the plain of trickery. To go to Yitzhak, his father, in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, so Rachel stole the household idols that belonged to her father. So what Laban would do, he was known as a great sorcerer in the land. He was a pagan sorcerer. He would consult his idols and the demonic forces. This is the other thing about AI, is it's a conduit for demonic forces to channel through and to use. So idols were used the same way. Divination would be you would do certain uh, ceremony and ask your idols, um, what does tomorrow hold for me? Or in this case, the reason why Rachel stole the idols is because she knew her father would ask them, where did they go? And he would be able to hunt them down that much faster. So she steals the idols so that he won't be able to do his divination. And this is the reason why she's taken them. And... Yaakov outwitted Laban, the Arami, the trickster, by not telling him of his intended flight. So he tricked the trickster. So he fled with everything he had. He departed and crossed the Euphrates River and set out for the hill country of Gilad. Not until the third day was Laban told what Yaakov, that Yaakov had fled. Now Laban took his kinsmen with him and spent the next seven days pursuing Yaakov, overtaking him in the hill country of Gilad. But God came to Laban, the Arami, in a dream that night and said to him, Be careful that you do not say anything to Yaakov, either good or bad. 
No mixture again. Only good. When Laban caught up with Yaakov, Yaakov had set up camp in the hill country, so Laban and his kinsmen set up camp in the hill country of Gilad as well. Laban said to Yaakov, What do you mean by deceiving me? Now the same word that he used against uh, Yaakov, that Yaakov had asked him, Why do you deceive me? He's asking him. You've carried off my daughters as if they were captives in war. Why did you flee in secret and deceive me and not tell me? I would have sent you off with joy and singing to the music of tambourines and lyres. You didn't even let me kiss my sons and daughters goodbye. What a stupid thing to do. I have it in my power to kill you, to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night and said, Be careful that you don't say anything to Yaakov, either good or bad. Granted that you have to leave because you long so deeply for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? Yaakov answered Laban, Because I was afraid, I said, Suppose you take your daughters away from me by force. But I did not take your gods. If you find your gods with somebody, that person will not remain alive. So now this word comes out as a double witness against Rachel. Remember she said it would be better that I was, and now he's saying, Whoever is caught with the idols will not stay alive. So our kinsmen are here to witness. If you spot anything that I have which belongs to you, you take it back. Yaakov did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Laban went into Yaakov's tent, then into Leah's tent, then into the tent of the two slave girls, but he did not find them. He left Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the saddle of the camel, and she was sitting on the camel so that they wouldn't be searched. Laban felt all around the tent, but did not find them. She said to her father, Please don't be angry that I'm not getting up in your presence, but it's that time of the month for me, so I shouldn't move. So this way he didn't search underneath her on the saddle of the camel. So he searched, but he didn't find the household gods. Then Yaakov became angry and started arguing with Laban. What have I done wrong, he demanded. What is my offense, that you have come after me in hot pursuit? You have felt around in all my stuff, but you... But what have you found of all your household goods? Put it here in front of my kinsmen and yours so that they can render judgment between the two of us. I have been here with you these twenty years. Your female sheep and your goats haven't aborted their young, and I haven't eaten the males in your flock. If one of your flock was destroyed by a wild animal, I didn't bring the carcass to you, but bore the loss myself. So he'd take one of his own sheep and give it to him. You demanded that I compensate you for any animal stolen, whether by day or by night. Here's how it was for me. During the day, thirst consumed me, and at night, the cold. Remember, he was 70 years old when he started this work for Laban. So from 70 to 90, he's been out in the hot weather and thirst by day and the cold by night, serving him faithfully. Even without sleep, he says. These 20 years I have been in your house, I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you've changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the one whom Yitzhak fears, had not been on my side, by now you would have certainly already sent me away with nothing. God has seen how distressed I have been and how hard I have worked, and last night he passed judgment in my favor. Laban answered Yaakov, The daughters are mine, the children are mine, the flocks are mine, 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 everything you see is mine. Does that sound like the epitome of self? But what can I do today about these daughters or the children you have bore? So now come, let's make a covenant, I and you, and let it stand as a testimony between me and you. So Yaakov took a stone and set it upright as a pillar, as a standing stone of this covenant. Then Yaakov said to his kinsmen, Gather some stones. And they took stones, made a pile of them, and they ate there together. It was always a way to ratify the covenant, to eat after a covenant had been made, and to drink the wine, which represents the blood that ratifies the covenant. Laban called it Yagar Sahaduta, means a pile of witness in Aramaic, while Yaakov called it Gal Ed, which means a pile of witness in Hebrew. Laban said, you know, it's interesting, this word witness, it's the ayin and the dalit. These are the two letters that are enlarged in the Shema, that God, the Lord our God, is one. So in essence, 
this testimony that we say in the greatest commandment that God is one, there's only one God, is the greatest witness that we have. This is a little hint at that, even in him calling it Gal Ed. Laban said, the pile of witnesses between me and you today, this is why it is called Gal Ed, and also Ha Mitzpah, the watchtower, because he has said, may Adonai watch between me and you when we are apart from each other. And as God's faithful, we are called watchmen of Yah, watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem, and we're to warn the people of what's to come. Just like the call to come out of Babylon, God says, come out of her, my people, that you participate not in her sins, and you receive not of her plagues. So we're to be watchmen. If you cause pain to my daughters, he said, if you take wives in addition to my daughters, then even then no one is there with us. Still God will be a witness between me and you. Laban also said to Yaakov, here is this pile and here is this standing stone which I have set up between me and you. May this pile be an odd, a witness, and may the standing stone be an odd a witness that I will not pass beyond this pile to you and you will not pass beyond this pile to me to cause harm. May the God of Abraham and also the God of Nahor, the God of their fathers, judge between us. But Yaakov swore by the one his father Yitzhak feared. Yaakov offered a sacrifice on the mountain and invited his kinsmen to the meal. And they ate food there and ratified the covenant and spent the whole night on the mountain. So here this Torah portion that begins with Yaakov's focus on this ladder and the need to preserve this pure image of God in man ends with us being a witness of the covenant God has made with us. To make us in his image is not a light thing. Everything throughout the history of the world has been to deface the image of God in man. And this morning, as we meditate on this word, I'd just like to encourage you to contemplate every aspect of your life, that which you look at, that which you listen to, that which you eat, it's affecting us. By beholding, we become changed into that likeness. So be careful what you spend the majority of your time with. And in our day, we know how subtly technology has crept in our lives and how much we're focused on it. May we go back to God's word and spend more time in God's word being recreated in his image than in the image of this counterfeit. With that, let's stand and we will take a break. Abba Father, we love you and we thank you for revealing to us the deep, deep things of your Torah. It is amazing how your word transcends the ages, Father, and how these stories of what occurred with our forefathers thousands of years ago applies to us today. And so we thank you, Father. Only you could plant in your Torah the depth of wisdom that transcends space and time and that helps protect us, that is a witness even for every age. And may we be found as a faithful witness and watchman on the walls, Father, warning your people to come out of Babylon in these days, this false system that has been set up to counterfeit you and your true image in us. We love you, we thank you, and we ask for the blood covering of Mashiach to be upon us and the anointing of your Ruach so that we can be overcomers and be called pillars in your temple, Father. This is our prayer and this is our desire. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.